So we find ourselves in this Joseph series, really in the heart of it, as we've talked about Joseph, the favorite when he was younger. Now we've moved into this dreams aspect of it. And we find ourselves kind of piggybacking off of last week where we had the baker and the cupbearer who were in prison. And um, Joseph was also in prison and he has, they have these dreams. Joseph interprets them and uh, they find those dreams do come true. And I want to spend some time talking this morning about dreams, but also kind of being put in this season of waiting. Um, let me ask you a question. It takes some interaction. Like, please, you have to participate. Um, who here remembers having a nightmare as a child? Anybody? All right. So that section's lying in church and you're being judged. All right. So, um, you, but who? Seriously, help me out here. Who remembers having a nightmare as a kid? You like run into your parents' room, you're like, oh my gosh, and you like fall apart and you're super scared. I remember the weird witch lady that came and took me like through this manhole thing into an underground work thing. It freaked me out. It was a bad dream. And um, I wouldn't leave the grass for a while. So I was that dude for a little bit. But um, I remember those bad dreams, right? We have these dreams where where they can really affect us. It's funny, um, I don't remember the dream too well that I'm about to tell you, but I had uh, a bad dream as an adult. And one of the great parts of marriage is that there's someone there to tell you when you're a freak in the middle of the night, right? And um, I, I, I know this, this is what happened. Um, apparently, I was making these weird sounds, like kind of freaking out, just whimpering a little bit. I walk around, I flip on the light, and I'm just kind of like, like a little Frankenstein, just, you know, like being weird and kind of crying a little bit. I, she, Erica said I was crying, but I don't trust her on that one. And, um, and she, she said I was like kind of freaking out. And then what I do remember is I flipped on the light and I was like, oh, and I'm an adult. I'm an adult at this point. I have no self-respect because of this. And I was like, oh, oh, and Erica said, what's wrong? I vaguely, this is where my memory kicks in. I vaguely remember hearing her ask that. And I was like, there's a spider. There's a huge spider. And then like I heard myself say it and you're kind of like, oh, no. And Erica goes, there's not a spider. And I was like, shut up. And I turned the light off and I went to bed. So you must know, we also offer marital counseling and kind speech in the middle of the night. Um, Dan Seaborn once told us, never hold a fight you have in the middle of the night against each other. Because I think I was pretty rude, but there was a huge like ape-like spider. I hate spiders. I hate them with all of my heart and soul. They're terrifying eight-legged madmen. And I just hate them. And this spider, he was huge. It was huge. Of course, if it was real in my mind, I would make that noise in front of you. He was huge, a giant bulby back. Ah, it was awful. And I remember that dream. But here's the thing, Erica, not wanting to let this awesome moment of vulnerability go, researches it on Google and finds out when you have a spider dream, you're afraid people are working to undermine or harm you. And I was like, hey, man, it's happening. You know, I just kind of fell apart. And, um, and I do remember in this, in this dream, like, the unnerving nature of it. It, it unnerved me, as, even as an adult. And, and I think it's important that we recognize we don't sanitize and scrub context out of Scripture. We need to hold on to it. We need it to make sense as it was because what made sense in reality then still holds true now. We're going to look at when God gets into the mind of the king of Egypt and Pharaoh has a dream in Genesis 41. We are going to read about the effect and what went on there. Two full years, when two full years had passed, Pharaoh had a dream. What that's referring to is Joseph had been in prison for two years after he said to the baker, remember me, or the cupbearer, remember me when you get out. Two more years had passed before um, Pharaoh has this dream. He was standing, Pharaoh was standing by the Nile when out of the river they came seven cows. They were sleek, they were fat, and they grazed among the reeds. After them, seven other cows were ugly and gaunt, and they came up out of the Nile and stood beside those sleek and fat cows on the riverbank. And the cows that were ugly and gaunt ate the seven sleek fat cows. And then Pharaoh woke up. 
That's a little terrifying when you have cows eating cows. That'd be upsetting to me. But anyways, um, that's uh, it's our job to eat cows. All right, so um, he fell asleep again, and he had a second dream. Seven heads of grain, healthy and good, were growing on a single stalk. After them, seven other heads of grain sprouted. They were thin, and they were scorched by the east wind. The thin heads of grain swallowed up the seven healthy full heads. Then Pharaoh woke up. It had only been a dream. In the morning, his mind was troubled. He sent for all of the uh, magicians and wise men of Egypt, and Pharaoh told them his dreams, but no one could inter- interpret them for them, for him. Then the chief cupbearer, this guy, chief cupbearer cup says, today I'm reminded of all my shortcomings. That does not atone for the fact that he forgot Joseph to rot in a prison for two years. Like, I love that. Like, there's a little humanity in there. Like, that moment where you're like, oh, that's what I was supposed to tell you. Yeah, there's a dude in prison. Like, maybe you're good with it. I would be pretty upset. Um, so here we go. Uh, Pharaoh was once again, was once angry with his servants, the cupbearer says, and he imprisoned myself and the chief baker in the house of the captain of the guard. Each of us had a dream that same night. And each dream had a meaning of its own. Now, a young Hebrew was there with us. He was a servant of the captain of the guard. We told him our dreams. He interpreted them for us, giving each man the interpretation of his dream. And the things turned out exactly as he interpreted them to us. I was restored to my position and, you know, like Doug was impaled. Sorry, Doug. Um, So um, the guy was impaled. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph and he was quickly brought from the dungeon. And when he shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to him, I had a dream. No one can interpret it, but I have heard it is said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Man, it's his big break. Here he goes, hits his moment, and he says, nope, I can't do it. But God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. So we see this moment where Joseph is having, well, God has used him. And Joseph is brought before Pharaoh. And I want to take a minute and I want to talk to to you today about this reality and this idea that, well, when two full years had passed, imagine what it was like the day Joseph interpreted the dreams for the baker and the cupbearer. Two days later, the baker is impaled, the cupbearer is restored, and Joseph had to be like, yes, I'm getting out of this pit. I'm so happy. Two years later, he's sitting there, and it must have been for him a season of silence that was maddening. Philip Brooks, he was a pastor in Boston. Apparently, one day, he was really agitated and upset, and someone said, Reverend Philip, what is wrong? And he says, the trouble is that I'm in a hurry, and God is not. And and to that I say amen, Brother Philip, because that is me, right? I'm like, God, if the 11th hour come now because it's the third and I really need things to get moving. I am not a patient person. And I find myself looking at this going, Just, Joseph must have been losing his mind down there. Or, or was he? See, he continued his daily routine. Remember, God was with Joseph in the prison as he was in Potiphar's house. God was with him and... He was elevated to a place of service. So Joseph would have continued his duties doing everything right. And I wonder if the time came after, let's say, about three months, he went, maybe this is all God has for me. Maybe my purpose in life was to serve these prisoners in Egypt. I don't get why I lost my family and everything, but maybe that's it. Maybe he came to peace with that. And the reality is that um, he probably had to have this moment where he kind of went, maybe this is all I'm supposed to do and be. Maybe this is all God had planned for me. And he was resigned to his fate. But the reality we have to look at is what if the the cupbearer had gone up the day he got out and told Pharaoh about Joseph and his dream interpretation? I don't think Pharaoh would have listened. I don't think he had a sense of urgency to need to hear an interpreted dream. He hadn't had one yet. So I think that speaks to us that there was actually, well, Pharaoh didn't need Joseph yet. And when we look at that and we understand that God was at work even in this place, I want to just dial back a little. I don't, uh, many of us are new to the church, so you may not remember this, but we did a Christmas series called Twas the List Before Christmas. 
And in this series, what we did is we talked about how God was active in the 400 years of silence between the end of Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament, and Matthew, the first gospel in the New Testament. There were 400 years of silence. God didn't speak to the prophets. God didn't give words. He didn't give visions. It was a tough time. It was during the time of Alexander the Great when the great um, Hellenization, the Greeking of the world took place because Alexander was expanding the borders of the Greek empire and the Greeks were fastidious when it came to the written word and how to track and chart history. So this was all going on during the intertestamental period, during Malachi to Matthew, there was a lot going on, but we call it the 400 years of silence. But silence doesn't mean God isn't at work. And that's what that series taught us. I mean, just flash back with me here. Think about what took place in the silence of those 400 years. Alexander the Great took over the known world and did what? He gave him a common language. He gave him a language that everybody would understand, which is critical because God was about to say something he wanted everybody to hear. We can see that God was working ahead. God was doing something to ensure that people would hear. God brought about the Roman Empire. And you think, what's the big deal with that? But he gave them roads. The Romans engineered roads that are still there today, yet we drive in Pothole Village out here, but the Roman roads are still there. You can walk them, and they were foot highways, but there was the version, the Roman Motel 6 um, was still there, and you know, like there was places for hospitality. It was safe, and it was this traveled road. The Romans gave roads, and Jesus Christ said, go therefore into all the world. God was making a way. God was doing things during the silence, even to the point that he was preparing for the birth of his son, Jesus Christ. Like, just think about this. God brings the Roman Empire into existence, and the Roman Empire ran on a heavy tax base. And what did they want? They're going to take a census of the whole known world so they can adequately tax those who benefit from the Roman rule. And what did that mean? It meant that Joseph and Mary had to go back to his ancestral home of Bethlehem, even though they lived in Nazareth. And the scriptures prophesied that the Messiah would come from Nazareth, but be born in Bethlehem. How does that work unless God's at work in the silence? Like this kind of stuff just makes me happy, right? You see it and you're like, wow, God's actually at work in this. We can see God's at work in the silence. And in the prison, we can see God's at work in Joseph. He's at work in Joseph. There's... um. President James Garfield was uh, once the president of a college, and a dad came to him who was a benefactor to that college, and he said to him, can you lighten the course load and requirements? My son is struggling in this class. One of those guys who writes a big check and influences you? You know what Garfield said to him? It depends what kind of son you want. Do you want a squash or an oak? A squash you can have with very little effort inside of a summer. An oak will take a century. Which kind of son do you want? And I think that's a lot of what's going on in this story. When we are waiting, we are in season of what seasons of what seems like pointless and unnecessary suffering and trial. And we have to understand that we are not victims of those circumstances. We're actually given opportunity within seasons of waiting to do a few different things, to choose how we're going to respond in the seasons of waiting. First thing we can do is we can grumble. I don't know about you, but like uh, you can grumble, plead your case, and do it without ceasing. All I hear when I, when I read that is, anybody been on a road trip with young children, right? So you all stayed home at spring break, or you just lied to me again, right? Who's doing road trips, young children? Help me out here. I knew your arms worked. All right, so you go on these road trips, it's like, can we have McDonald's? I'm so hungry, I have to pee, and I just need to go, and can I please, McDonald's, McDonald's, and I'm just like, Erica, can we give them Benadryl? Is there a shot? Like, and she always said no, but she'd be like, here, have some peanut butter with something in it, you know, like, and they just, in the back, you're like, yeah, silence, three hours of driving, and you get there because they would plead their case without ceasing. Have you ever had a kid do that, Mom? Mom, 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 mom. And you're just watching the mom like, dude, you got to stop. Like, you're going to get somebody hurt. Like, it could hurt me, you know. She's just like, throw a clothing rack at them because they won't stop pleading. They just want this toy. They just want that smoothie. They just want, want, plead, plead, beg, beg, beg until they break you down. You're like, fine, I will buy you McDonald's forever. Shut it. 
we do that to God thinking he's going to tire of our voices, but he doesn't. But we have that option. We can grumble, plead our case without ceasing. We can shake our fist at God and decide to give up on him. I've seen this, and it's heartbreaking when someone doesn't get what they want, when I don't get what I want, when God delays a dream, kills a dream, and we shake our fist at God and go, how dare you take that from me? I wanted that so bad. I needed that. That was formational to me. How dare you take that? How dare you delay that? And we shake our fist, and we question the character of a God who sent his son while we were yet sinners. That's another option. The third thing we can do is open our hands and express in humility that we don't understand why this is happening, but we trust that God knows and has a purpose, and we can turn towards or kind of turn into and snuggle into God, and we can live like this. We talk about this at the Foundry Church. Your life is going to have some really good things in it, and your life is going to have some crazy downtimes too, painful And if we live like this, we recognize that God may put a blessing in our life, and it was never ours. We got to steward it. And when God puts into our hands painful circumstances, we know they remain God's. And we can walk with him and turn towards God and trust God and snuggle into God like a big bear of a dad and just say, okay, I don't get why this is happening. I don't know why there's so much pain, but I do trust in your character. I know you're for me, but this hurts. That's our third option, and I think it's what Joseph did because Joseph's character rises to the level of being beyond reproach. Joseph never shakes his fist at God. Joseph doesn't continually plead his case. I'm sure there were the moments where he was like, this is horrendous, and I would like it to stop, right? I mean, that's one thing, but he didn't plead it all the time. It shows that he served. The Lord was with him. He lived into his duties, and what Joseph did is he expressed in humility that he didn't understand why. God would hand him this plate of bad in life. But he took it and he made the most of God's given opportunities in his life. So we find that God was at work even in the prison. God was at work inside the prison. And biblically, this is like where the iron's the hottest. I wanna read to you a couple of things. This is where God works throughout scripture in prisons. The prophet Daniel, lion's den, different uh, situations. Jeremiah, the prophet, thrown into a pit in prison there. Paul wrote the book of Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon from the Mamertinian prison in downtown Rome. He wrote the epistles to the church. I mean, we just went through the Ephesians series. Thank God Paul was in prison long enough to stop evangelizing and start discipling us with the word of God that he wrote, right? We can look at Peter. He wrote, uh, he wrote from Rome and was in prison there. Peter was the first bishop of the church of Rome. We can look at James was in prison. John, the apostle, the one that Jesus loved, John the apostle was imprisoned on the island of Patmos where there was nothing for him there to do except that one day God grabbed the heavens and he peeled them back and he showed John a vision that we call the book of Revelation. Sometimes those painful places of waiting are where God gets really deep into our life because we have nothing else to do but wait on him. We have nothing else to do but depend on him to take the next ragged, tired breath. So we find that God's at work in this lowly, broken prison, but God's not just dealing in the lowly, broken places. He reaches into the mind of the highest society at the highest level of leadership, and he puts a dream into Pharaoh's mind as well. God gets to work in Pharaoh's mind, and quite often what I believe is God likes to make us discomforted and uneasy and get us on a search for answers because here's one thing. God knows he's the answer, so he likes us when we're seeking him. When people say, you know, I'm looking for God, I I love to say this. My friend and pastor, Tim Wilson, said it this way. Always search for truth because God is truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So if we search for truth, we will find God. And we search for him in the scriptures. What we find in this is that God made Pharaoh uneasy. He woke up from a dream that troubled him. This is going to be fun. Wives, have you ever had a dream where your husband was a jerk and like kissed another woman in the dream? Help me out. Come on, just don't be ashamed. Anybody? Yeah, we, there she is, pregnant. I do, I have dreams all the time. Hormones everywhere. Right, and when you have that dream, you wake up and you grab them at 3 a.m. and you're like, whack. 
you're a jerk. <laughs> and you start crying, and then, and then like as a husband, you're like, what's up? What's going down? I'm being hit in the middle of the night, and I feel sad because I'm tired. Why, why are we crying? What happened? And like, I dream you liked another girl. I've been woken because you're crazy, <laughs> right? But, but you look at your wife, and when it happens, she doesn't think it's cute or funny because I'm like this, ha, 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 oh. Yeah, that's horrible of me. I don't know if I should be punished, go eat Oreos. What is expected of me, right? Because it affects, and the next day, like they're having coffee and like this. And you're like, I didn't do anything. I, there's a wet spot on a pillow. I was like, ha, ah, I was near you. Your mind is broken, not mine. Don't punish me. That's where Pharaoh was out. He woke up and he was troubled. What's wrong? Nothing. Right in nothing. He had a bad dream. God quite often makes us uncomfortable in our own heads to go searching for the answers, knowing that he's the answer. He's the answer we seek. And we don't usually search for answers when we're comfortable. Who, when they're having things go really well, is like, you know what? I just think I'm gonna go on a quest. Nobody does that. You're like, you know what? I think I'm gonna have a whole bag of Lay's potato chips. And I'm going to sit because life's pretty good and I don't have to do much else, right? I don't have to worry about anything. Whatever it is that you do, we usually don't search for answers when we're at peace and when we have all the answers. See, we live under this false reality that we have the answers right at hand, you know, that we can just get answers and we kind of control the universe until a diagnosis comes out of the blue and all our answers fly out the window like feathers, just and peace follows it and you go, well, wait a minute, what does this mean for us? We had plans. Until a car runs a red light and your whole world's turned upside down, until a job that seems secure and a retirement that was set in order, you had the condo pre-ordered in Florida, you were gonna spend most of your summers at a lake up north, and you had the house in Zealand, the lawn perfectly mowed, Dutch people kissing on the front of it. It was great, we're all set up, and they said, we no longer require your services. And you go, whoa, 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 whoa. That's not part of my plan. It's in those moments that we really get close to God, isn't it? I went through a time where God absolutely laid me bare. And I look back on it as one of the sweetest and most intimate times of my life with the Lord. It was awesome. I just don't want to go back there because it hurt. I'm like toothache hurt. It hurts so bad. But when we have all the answers, we generally don't seek them. We get proud and arrogant thinking we'll chart a path. And God says, wait a minute, my path still remains sovereign. And quite often, God will disrupt our comfort in order to get to his purposes through us. Make no mistake that we are made to be purposeful in the kingdom of God. So the question comes out, are you waiting? Are you in a season where you're waiting Oh, it's so hard to be in seasons where you wait, where you stare at a phone to ring and you sit there and you're like, God, please do something, do anything, smite me, hug me, just do something because you're tired of the waiting. Are you waiting for relief? I love Psalm 40. We've done it here a few times as a church. I think we're good, but we're still not you too. And I love to listen to that song, Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined and heard my prayer. He lifted me up out of the pit, out of the miry clay, and I will sing. I will sing a new song. He set my feet upon a rock. He made my footsteps firm. Oh, right? Relief. If you're in a season where you're like, God, just give me some relief, go read Psalm 40. Go read Psalm 40. That's your psalm. It's a prayer. He lifted me up out of the pit, out of the miry clay. We've all been stuck. We've all been there. If you're in a season of waiting for relief, read Psalm 40 and pray it as a prayer prophetically, but also pray it as something to give you hope that God doesn't abandon us to the pit. Are you, in a wait, are you waiting for a promotion? You've worked really hard in a company all your life, all your adult life you've served and given and they don't seem to know how much you contribute and you're wondering when God will open their eyes and you'll get the promotion that maybe gives you some breathing room that maybe allows you to have a few things you've always wanted. Are you waiting for the recognition and promotion? Are you waiting for a child? Have you wondered why God hasn't 
giving you a child, and every time we put the announcement of a baby on the screen, something inside of you just kind of seizes up because you're still waiting and you're still wondering, will God ever give to us what we desire with all our heart? Are you waiting for a loved one who's pulled away and rejected you? Do you look at your phone multiple times a day just to see if maybe they've texted, maybe they've called, maybe they're gonna reach out? Are you waiting for an answer from an employer? Are you waiting for a chance to prove yourself because you've made a mess of yourself enough in the past, but you've changed and you want a chance to prove that the changes will last? Are you waiting for your big break, for your opportunity to finally be what you think God called you to be? Are you waiting? Because in the waiting, you have an opportunity to humbly hold your hands out to God and say to him, I don't understand why I sit in this place of inactivity, loneliness, and frustration, but I trust in your character, in your wisdom, in your plan. I trust beyond what I see. I trust the God who sees everything. You have that opportunity if you're in a season of waiting. I'm not saying it's easy. I am saying that's where our character is formed. That's where God works in us in such a, in such a deep way that it changes who we are. It absolutely changes who we are. So we have to ask the question, how will you respond when there's sudden opportunity? Please don't forget, Joseph had probably resigned himself to his life in that dungeon serving there. He had been there years. He knew he was innocent and he had no hope. He was resigned to the life he was going to live there until one day some guy comes and says, Pharaoh wants to talk to you. To which I'd be like, great. He's going to put me on a stick. Like, you know, like I would, I, if you get called by Pharaoh, it's never that good. He says, Pharaoh wants to talk to you. They come in, they shave him, they put him in clothes, and they put him right in front of Pharaoh. And Pharaoh says, I have heard that you're a Hebrew who can interpret dreams. And I had a dream last night. And what did Joseph say? What did he say? He was finally out of prison. He was well shaved, dressed. He had his moment before Pharaoh and he said, I can't do it. You just like want to be a career advisor and be like, that was really stupid. You probably should have told him something different, but I'm going to just step back. Really bad. You can do it. Jump in, say something, you know. Wait, he, he, no, I can't do it. But the God I serve will give you the answers you want. Do you see what he did again? He pointed Pharaoh to God. He had a moment in front of the most powerful man on the face of the earth. And he said, I can't do it, but he can he pointed Pharaoh to a faithful engagement with God. It's an awesome moment. And he risked his life in doing so because he may not have gotten a second chance to finish the sentence, right? He could have been like, I can't do a thing. And off goes his head and well, I wasn't done, right? I mean, that's a risky answer. That was the sound of a sword, by the way. Um, <laughs> But that, that's a risky answer. But what he does is he points them to God. When he had the sudden opportunity, he turned them and himself towards God. When the answer, the blessing, the promotion, the news comes, how will you respond? The answer to that question is found in what you do while you wait. It's what you do while you're waiting that defines how you're going to respond when success suddenly bursts upon you. You can't do stupid things while waiting and expect a good outcome. As this one pastor, Bob Wilhite, used to tell me when I was young and foolish, he say, um, he'd say, they called me Brother Eric, which is weird, but um, he said, Brother Eric, you cannot sow your wild oats and pray for crop failure. And I was like, that sounds like witchcraft. I have no idea what that means. You know, I didn't really understand, but I grew up to understand you can't go do all these wild things and think you're not going to get a harvest from it. You can't Spend your time waiting, griping at God, shaking your fist at God, complaining without ceasing and all these things. And when your opportunity comes, what are you most likely to do? You're most likely to bear the fruit of what you've invested in. When you're waiting, you are called to that posture of hands open, character trusting that God's still at work amid your desolation. And the reality is we have to be active in this. We can't just kind of Sit back and pretend it's all going to be okay. What you do when there's sudden opportunity has everything to do with what you were doing while you were waiting. Your outcome depends on what you do right now. You can't pretend that shaking your fist at God will produce a character that is noble in God's eyes. It just won't. 
And so we have to be purposeful about our time. I don't know about you, but I pick up kids once in a while from different things. My kids, not just random kids. Um, that's super important to point out. Um, so I pick up my children. Sometimes I wonder why God lets me preach. Um, it didn't go well. Um, but I'll pick up my kids and I'll pull up to like football practice. And, and back before Josh could drive, um, I'd pull up and they're still practicing. I have like 15 minutes. So I'm like, oh, what effective use of time could I Facebook? That'd be awesome. <laughs> and I just, I waste time. I'm horrendous. I'm a giant toddler. You know, sometimes I'm like, I think this feels like a nap. And back the chair goes and I take a nap for 15 minutes. My wife, who went through college this past few years, what would she do? If she had 15 minutes, she'd reach back, grab her laptop, get out some history book on the Romanovs, read that, write a paper, plan out a meal schedule, email three people about what I you know, probably forgot to do, and then close it up and be like, hey, how you doing? And then be nice to the kids. The kids that come to the car after I've had 15 minutes of me time, I'm like, oh, hey, get in the car. Oh, you know, and you see what she did with her time and what I did with mine? Hers was invested in something. Mine was just kind of spent for me indulgently. We have to understand as the church, waiting isn't useless. Please hear me when I say that. Waiting isn't useless. There's a Chinese bamboo that grows. And when you plant it year one, you put the seed in the ground, you fertilize and water it. Year one, you get nothing. Year two, you fertilize water, same thing. You do that for four years. Yeah, guess what? I'm not growing. Um, <laughs> but like Chinese bamboo, right? Four years. Nothing, bubkiss, not even a little leaf to be like, hey, nothing, nothing. Year five, 90 feet. Well, I know, right? When I, <laughs> That's exactly what I said. I'm like, what? Why doesn't it just average it out? Like, have some balance, you know? <laughs> That's exactly what it is. But here's the thing. In our waiting, are we willing to water and fertilize the life of God? Are we willing to spend time in the word of God, trusting God's character, leaning in? When we have the opportunity to wait with God, we need to understand it's one-on-one -on -one between you and the creator of the universe. You might want to make use of it because when God turns you loose in whatever you were made to do, it'll look more like Chinese bamboo. It'll explode. God will add to your life. But here's the thing. How bad would Chinese bamboo be if it didn't do four years of root work? See, root work's the hard thing. It's when you're boring deep into the, you're doing the work underground. No one can see it. There's no fruit, no reward. Nothing feels good about it till year five. We have to be people who do root work. We need to understand that waiting isn't useless. It actually it's the time where we deepen our walk with God. We create a conversation. We slow down and we listen to the God who called us by name, formed us in his image, and while we were yet sinners, died on the cross for us. You can trust his character. You can know his purpose for you is good. You have to do it in the quiet. Character is formed when no one's looking. So is our roots in God. We have to be people who understand that if we're in seasons of waiting, it's probably not God's punishment. It's God's biggest gift and blessing for what he wants to do eventually. So maybe you're not there yet, but he is. He's right where you need him to be. It's your call of how you'll approach a season of waiting. Every one of us will go through it. Every one of us goes through seasons of waiting. You can hold me accountable as much as I'll hold you accountable that our job in those seasons is this. Not because we like it. I super duper hate it and don't like it at all and want it to go away. I don't like to wait. I don't mind waiting yesterday, but today's not the day for it, right? But this has to be my posture. This has to be your posture. We have to be people who understand the character of God is trustworthy. He will do what he promised in his timing, not ours. Will we respond when it finally grows, when Chinese bamboo goes 90 feet in one year, and you're like, whoa, what just happened? Well, the only answer will be, what'd you do the four years previous? How will you wait on God? I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined and heard my prayer. He lifted me up out of the pit, out of the miry clay, and I will sing. You may be in a season of waiting, but your song has yet to be sung. Pray with me. God, your goodness and your faithfulness goes to all generations. And Lord, we stand back and we confess that we are, we are fortunate to be a generation 
that has experienced your faithfulness. So come, Lord Jesus Christ, and speak to us in such a way that we would not be self-indulgent in our waiting, but we would be faithful. We would fix our eyes on the author, the perfecter of our faith, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, today we confess you are good against all the circumstances that this world throws at us, against all the diagnosis, all the heartache, all the tragedy, all the wars and different things, we confess that you, Jesus Christ, are good. And you continue to do all things for good for those who love the Lord. So Lord, today we confess we love you. We confess that you are good. And Lord, we even sing of it now. We lift our voices in confession that despite our circumstances, your goodness is not in question. Your faithfulness is not in question. Indeed, it extends to all generations. May our generation lift our voice and declare this truth even now. In Christ's name, amen. If the story of Joseph teaches us one thing, I think it teaches us this, that the character of God is good and your circumstances don't define him. We are going to have troubles but we have a God who loves us. And it's our duty, it's our high calling to give witness to Christ in the bad days. I believe this, the church gives greater glory and witness to God when it struggles than when it's successful. Because when we're all successful, we kind of forget our source. But when we're struggling, when we're hurting, when we're on our knees in prayer, asking God to guide, lead, and speak, we as a community become, well, we're transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. He makes us more into his image. That can't be an easy process. It can't be easy. Remember, baptism is into the death of Christ to be raised into the new life in Christ. Much of us must die in order to become like Christ. And the reality is that is a crushing time. But it's all for the glory of Christ. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit through willing servants who will say this, I trust you. Beyond my circumstances, beyond my happiness, I trust you. It is not easy, but your life will give witness to the one who died on your behalf while you were yet a sinner if you live with that posture. So go and live faithfully in your seasons of waiting and in your seasons of blessing, giving glory and recognition to the one who has redeemed and lifted you up out of the pit. As you do, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it is time for the church to leave the building. You are dismissed.